how precise and intricate the language is. But here's my real second point. As far as the Quran is concerned, one of its profound, most profound miracles is actually the word Quran. The word Quran itself. Quran comes from, in Arabic, comes from the word Qara'a, which means to recite. Yeah. But the way it's formed with that an at the end, what it really means is that which is recited excessively. One of the core meanings of the word Quran is that which is recited excessively. Now think about this. We're living in uh, the, the age of mass media. Mm -hmm. right? We're in, living in the age where some artist comes out with a song yeah. and a million MP3s are downloaded. Mm -hmm. right? um, and we are saying, we are arguing that one of the things that makes Quran miraculous, it is that it is the most recited. It is the most recited. Now, now think about this. You have this song or this movie or whatever that's on top of the charts. Yeah. How long does it stay on top of the charts? Not too long. Let's just give it, let's say six months, which is crazy, yeah. but let's just say six months. Six months, millions of people are listening to this one song and humming it and singing it, whatever. Then it just gets played out. It gets played out. Just one phrase in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. One phrase. I begin with the name of, or with the name of Allah, the excessively merciful, the constantly merciful. Right? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is recited countless times a day by millions and millions and millions of Muslims every single day for the last millennium and a half. It's been it's been on top of the charts. It's the most recited word, mm -hmm. and it's actually more read statistically than even the Bible in the world. And the Muslims are not the majority population. The Muslims are a minority as opposed to. Uh, the Christian community in the, in, in the world. And even then, being a fifth or less of the world population, this is the most recited book. Come up with something that can stay on top of the charts, consistently like the Qur'an. That the people won't lose focus and will continue to recite it, recite it, recite it, recite it. Every single day, day in and day out. It's incredible. So this is another, actually, miracle of the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. Another small miracle on the side, I don't want to go to the main ones, but even before I get to the main one, uh, the, the side miracle. The Qur'an says about uh, Muhammad It says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We have elevated your mention. He sa the Qur'an says about Muhammad that he has elevated the mention of the Messenger If you know about the call to prayer in Islam, the Adhan, uh, the Adhan includes the words, أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا Rasulullah, I bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. And whenever we hear that, we send a praise upon the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Yeah. If you look at the world today, Muslims are all over the world. And you know how there are different time zones? Uh -huh. There's not a minute that goes by that there's not an Adhan going on somewhere. Hmm. Somewhere in the world, an Adhan is taking place. A call to prayer. The, the, a call to prayer is taking place. And in that call, whose mention is being elevated? The creator of the heavens and earth. The creator of the heavens and the earth, and then the mention of his the last, messenger. His last and final messenger. His last and final messenger is being, uh, uh, born, it's being born witness that he's the messenger of Allah, and people are hearing it and elevating his status by saying, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. What did the Quran say? We have elevated your status. Oh. Can you imagine somebody else being praised like this? Consistently, every single day, 24-7, globally, across languages and cultures. And Allah, just one small statement in the Qur'an, we have elevated your status, and your mention. And his mention is taking place, sallallahu alayhi wa just by that one phrase of the Qur'an, unparalleled. Now that praise is because he was our teacher, showing us, just like Jesus at his time was showing people absolutely. how to worship God. Absolutely, this is God. A, absolutely critical. And the same thing is... So we, we say, as, as much as we uh, acknowledge and honor and show regard to our messenger, yeah. we acknowledge that he is a slave of Allah, that he is not the one we worship, he is the one we obey because God gave him revelation. Yeah. And he is a human being just, just, just like anybody else. Like and actually he, he was commanded in the Qur'an. This is really critical. Yeah. He was commanded in the Qur'an to say, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Say, I am just... Literally, Bashar means a human being made of skin and flesh. Yeah. It's literally referring to the mortal being. He's saying, tell them, Allah is telling them, tell them I am just a mortal being like yourself. Just like all the messages. Jesus. Just, Moses, Noah, like Abraham, the they had the same message, worship God, not themselves. They exactly. were mere mortals. Yes. Okay, let's continue. Give us some more. I'm really, okay. This is a so, so you have, this was actually a side yeah. miracle, but it's a profound statement. I mean, come up with somebody else who's got higher celebrity status yeah. than the Messenger of Allah. And no matter how much you criticize him and hate on him and have, uh, you know, you, you have documentaries made or horrible speeches made by some, you know, uh, some anti-Islam groups, 
that, that spew lies and filth and take things out of context against him. No matter how much you do that, it still doesn't reduce his praise any. Yeah. It actually continues to grow. It, his mention and his, his followers actually continue to grow. So actually, they're, they're actually fueling their own fire. SubhanAllah. Tell Anyhow. us, we're, we're almost out of time. Give us uh, another one of okay. these amazing miracles. Now here's one that, because uh, I was a student of philosophy and also of history, yeah. it really it baffled me. You know the idea of, when, when most Americans when they go to high school, we study about revolutions, right? We study about the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Russian Revolution. Uh, we study, in, in these revolutions, we talk, when we talk about a revolution, we talk about a society that had some sort of an uprising against a regime mm -hmm. and something changed. If you talk about, for example, the French Revolution, right? It was, uh, authority used to be in the hands of the church and it was overturned and now it was in the hands of the people. So popular democracy, that was the revolution. A lot of people lost their lives, right? In, in struggling for that idea or that cause. But in the end, after that revolution was done, did people still eat the same things they used to eat? Did they still speak the same language? Was their family relations pretty much the same? Did anything else change dramatically? Not, not significantly. The culture was pretty much the same. The overlying thought process, and then it, over, over a long period of time, there were significant differences in the culture. Similar thing in the Russian Revolution. Russian culture before and after the revolution is very similar. Mm -hmm. What did change? The economic system changed. The czar has been overthrown, etc., etc. But now if you think about this, these revolutions that are great revolutions in history that people talk about, let's take the Russian Revolution, the Communist Revolution, it is authored by great minds like Karl Marx. Right? Marx was a German. He lived 60 years before the revolution happened. Mm -hmm. Did he ever imagine that his book, his writings, his ideas are going to get people to so fired up, they're willing to give up their lives for this cause? No. He never saw this. I mean, he's a thinker, a writer, a librarian even. He's sitting in the library doing his, his research, right? He's a thinker, philosopher. Now compare all of this, these revolutions that are political in nature, sometimes social in nature, a lot of times economic in nature. These are what revolutions are, political, social, and economic. Mm -hmm. Compare these revolutions to what happened in Arabia, like you said at the beginning of the show, in 23 years. The Quran was revealed to Muhammad ﷺ when he was at the age of 40. It stopped being revealed when he died at the age of 63. So there's a 23 year period. The man who is presenting this idea that no one should be worshipped except Allah, and he alone is the authority that should be worshipped and obeyed, he presents this radical idea to his community. People reject him by far, but some people start joining in, joining his ranks. Within 23 years, this has never happened before in human history, that an entire society has undergone a revolution, but it's not just political, and it's not just economic, and it's not just social. It's also spiritual, it's also dietary, it's also hygienic. The way people speak changed, the way people deal with their wife changed, the way they do business changed, the way they, the way they uh, interact with each other, with their neighbor changed, the way in many cases the way they dress changed, right? The way uh, what they love changed and what they hate changed, what they wanted to live for and what they wanted to die for changed and the government changed, and the economics changed, right? The big stuff changed. You know when we talk about revolution, we talk about big stuff. But life on, at the lower levels, inside your home, it's still the same. But these 23 years brought about this change in this society that you can never imagine in any society in such a short period of time. And completely revolutionize the society. I don't know of any document in human history that is, first of all, the one presenting that document, in this case, Muhammad Wasallam. The one presenting that document is also the one struggling for its cause mm -hmm. because all these other revolutions are philosophers and writers who died long before the actual revolutions happened. Here you have the revelation coming to him. He himself is struggling for this cause. He's not sitting in some library or behind some couch and writing these things and other people are willing to die for them. He's in front of the battlefield and he brings about this profound spiritual, personal, psychological, social, political, economic revolution in a complete way in this society, so much so it's already ready to challenge other world powers. I mean, look at Arabia 23 years ago. He's at the age of 63, right? Yeah. Look at Arabia 23 years ago. It's a place where the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire and the Abyssinians, they're all surrounding the Arabs. Nobody wants to invade the Arabs. You know why? What do they have? They got desert. There's nothing there. 
why should we send our soldiers out to toast? Because there's no, hum there's no resources, oil hasn't been discovered yet, right? Mm -hmm. this, these people were considered powerless Bedouins that traveled the desert, and yet in 23 years, they are ready to challenge the superpowers of the world. And they've completely revolutionized how they live. You have people that, that were such criminals, that were, you know, they were known for robbing and pillaging and stealing before Islam, and now they are governors, and they are treasurers of cities, and if they find one penny missing from the treasury, they're willing to give their life up to get justice for that one person. Complete change in people. This is one of the most profound aspects of the Qur'an is a miracle. It, com it brought complete change, not to just the individual. You know, when a person accepts Islam, it's a revolution inside that person. We're talking about revolution inside people, in their family, in their neighborhood, in their society, at every level within 23 years. This is amazing. we got to just glance over a few things that we mentioned. Uh, you don't have to go into depth because we just have a couple more minutes. Sure. But this will just entice people to look into this further. The scientific miracles of how we were developed and other things about the creation that was mentioned 1400 years ago that we're discovering they are indeed true today. Yes. Can you just glance over this real quick? Yeah, this is, this is part of a larger subject called yeah. basically the consistency between scientific phenomenon and the Qur'an. Uh, there's a lot of research being done on this topic in the Arab world. Specifically, scholars like Sheikh Zanadani have done a lot of work in this area. Um, the one you mentioned, the, the, the graphic and uh, meticulous description of the embryo as presented in the Qur'an is actually completely consistent with modern scientific findings under a microscope, right? Um, and uh, there's a great book on it, The Bible, Quran, and Science by Maurice Bukwa. Okay, it's so one of the first. See, they could see that. They could, they could look up that book. And, the and Bible, look at Quran, that. and Science. The Bible, the Quran, and, and Science. Uh, it's a great book on this topic. Maurice Bouquet. Maurice Bouquet, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you have, you have that angle. Another interesting, of the hundreds of scientific phenomena that are in the Quran, uh -huh. just one quickly, uh, in a very curious ayah in Surah 57, Allah says, "Wa anzal al hadid." We sent iron down. We sent iron down. He, he, I mean, for mountains, he says we created mountains. For the sun, he said we created the sun. We created the earth. But for iron, he didn't say we created. He used a peculiar verb. We uh -huh. sent it down. I was talking to a few geologists about this, and they said they believe that the the uh, iron came to the earth historically in the form of meteors and was buried deep into the wow, earth. Wow, this is amazing. So, you know, and, and just the, 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 the verbiage of the Qur'an and that he sent it down, subhanAllah. So this in itself is a consistent subject, which actually isn't my expertise, but I'm very curious about it. I'm more on the side of language and linguistic research. we got one more minute. Tell the people now, what is this Qur'an? What is the Creator through this living miracle that we have the Qur'an? If they submit to it, what is it? the benefits hmm. of coming and doing what this book God is telling us. This to do. book on the one hand is a miracle, but on the other hand it is a personal guidance for your life. It is personal, personal guidance for your life. It guides you and it shows you the way in your daily struggles. And I'm telling you this from personal experience and of those that are close to me. This book has opened doors. I know people that went to the library, started reading a translation of the Quran and they came back and they said, I didn't read the Quran, the Quran read me. Mm -hmm. This book is a good picture of where you stand with your Lord, what you need to be doing on a daily basis, which is why one of the greatest definitions of the Qur'an in the Qur'an, besides it being guidance, is that it's a reminder. People forget their purpose in life. People forget what they're here on the earth to do. They get dissuaded or they get you know, uh, distracted by entertainment and by movies and by YouTube or this or that or the other. They get distracted into many different things. And here you have a reminder constantly bringing you back to your essential purpose. Thank you for being with us again. Sorry we're out of time. We're going to have to do something again with you. Absolutely. I hope you all got the benefit. You heard the man. He gave you a few things that you can ponder over. You got to be what? Honest with yourself. You got to be sincere and ask the one who created the heavens and the earth and everything in this universe to guide you, to make it clear. And it's there. It's very simple. And we hope to see you again next time. Come back here every week at thedeanshow.com. And until next time, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you.